I mean, it was centuries ago when they started creating medical journals. And they've kind of been the same for hundreds of years, which is a paper journal, some studies in it. You distribute a subscription and people read it. But clearly right now, everything is changing. And that's not just large language models or open access, but everything is changing. You're listening to Parallax from Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. Here is your host, Ankur Kalra, MD. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, another episode of Parallax. This is the second episode for season six. Um, in case um, you haven't listened to the first episode for season six, it's with Alex Carter uh, from the London School of Economics on the importance of economics, outcomes, and management in, in modern day cardiology and medicine. I do uh, recommend that you go back and listen to that one. Um, it's sort of a great season opener. Uh, you know, I may be biased, but uh, some of the early feedback that we've heard uh, is that people have really enjoyed listening to Alex um, talk on health economics and, and policy. Um, so with, with that, I have a very special guest for this episode. Um, uh, she is, uh, we popularly know her in the U.S. as the editor-in-chief of Jack Advances. Uh, you know, she's professor of medicine at University of Toronto. I don't think she needs any introduction. Uh, Dr. Candace Silversides is our guest on today's show. Um, and, um, you know, we have lots to talk about. Uh, you know, we've, uh, I've had the immense uh, fortune and privilege of uh, getting to know her as an editor in chief, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, her interest in our work that we've sent to Jack Advances. Um, and, you know, she's always been very collaborative, very welcoming, and, um, you, you know, very uh, forward thinking, um, perhaps the reason why she was chosen as the editor-in-chief of Jack Gordon Code Advances. So with that introduction, uh, Candice, uh, welcome on the show, and thank you so much for doing this for us. Thanks, Ankur. I'm so happy to be here, and uh, it's a real pleasure to get to talk with you anytime. So uh, thank you very much. I know that the pleasure is, is mine as well, likewise. Um, so, Candice, um, I'm going to start by asking you, you know, I think the, the very first question here is, uh, what made you apply for the editor-in-chief position for Jack Advances, you know, other than the fact that we, you know, we all will resonate with, with the fact that, you know, Jack Journals is, is a prestigious um, family of journals to represent and and to 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 work for other than that however uh, you know I, i'm sure there was there was a calling so with, i would love to hear your thoughts on that yeah that's a, a great question i think you know i had been doing cardiology for a while uh, when i applied i probably wouldn't have done something like this early in my career um, just because of the early in my career is very much focused on being a cardiology, publishing my own science. Um, but I really did appreciate the world of cardiology journals in that, you know, I really appreciate that it was really advancing the field, moving things forward. And so when this opportunity came up a little bit further along in my career, it seemed like a really nice transition to try something new in a field I th or in an area that, that I thought was really important for the field of cardiology. So I think it was just an interesting opportunity that came about at the right time in my life. And, and uh, it's been a great experience so far. Yes. And, you know, do you want to walk us through um, maybe, you know, your life as an editor-in-chief of, of a journal like Jack Advances? Um, you know, how does that role or how does that hat fit into the hat of professor of medicine at University of Toronto and a cardiologist? Um, yeah, that is uh, that is uh, a good question as well, because uh, it does require a fair bit of juggling. As I think you probably know as well, you having had an editorial role very similar. I guess there's two aspects of Jack Advanced. Is one, who, one was acting as an editor-in-chief, but the other was also starting a journal which is, you know, it, it has some different challenges instead of just like jumping into a journal that, that's already up and running. So uh, both aspects were 
part of how I but were part of how I focused my time. But in terms of just getting it up and running, uh, it was really invaluable to be part of the Jack family because they already had a well-oiled machine about how to get a journal off the ground. Then in regards to kind of what I do on a day-to-day basis as an editor in chief, it's it's a lot of organizational work in terms of you know, making sure we triage papers, that we work with the editorial board to select the right editor so that papers can get a fair shake at being reviewed by some people that have expertise in that field. It's about, you know, with with the papers, it's more than just a paper and getting reviews. But, you know, nowadays we also have the accompanying central figures. So it's making sure there's a good central figure that'll go with it. Similar to what you're doing here, we have podcasts with the papers to try and really disseminate the science. So I think there's a lot of aspects. How it affects my day-to-day work? Well, I'm still a clinician and I'm a clinician at heart. So I still do clinical cardiology. I obviously do general cardiology, but I work in a few little niche fields of cardiology, uh, that being adult congenital heart disease and cardiobstetrics. I'm also an echocardiographer. So I jump around between a number of different clinical aspects of cardiology, but the editor-in-chief role really involves, you know, the organizational aspects of making sure papers are adjudicated fairly and making sure we get the science out to readers and also trying to think of ways to innovate the journal so that it has some modern features and so that it's a journal that people actually want to read. Yes. And, you know, I think it's, uh, th- that's a great answer, you know, Candice, by the way. So uh, as an extension to that answer, um, I'm sure the work that you do as an editor-in-chief has enhanced your um, your role as a clinician, as an echocardiographer, um, you know, in your, also within your own, you know, your own niche, as you just mentioned, you know, cardiobstetrics and adult congenital heart disease. Um, do um, these roles um, sort of uh, synergize each other? Uh, you know, and w- what I mean by that is that when you see an unusual case as a clinician, uh, now that you are at the helm for Jack Advances, does that um encounter with with that particular patient that particular unusual patient spur on you know thoughts and ideas of what you want to do with your platform as an editor in chief and vice versa do you get submissions um um as an editor in chief which then translate into you becoming uh, an even better clinician uh, handling some of these you know complex topics yeah absolutely um i really I mean, that's really one of the advantages of working at a journal like Jack, well, a family of journals like Jack, is that they're really, they're primarily clinical journals. So they're really anchored on clinical cardiology. I mean, I just came off general cardiology, and I can tell you that helps to ground you a bit. And then as as the papers come in, because, you know, it's a lot of general cardiology topics, and they're very diverse it does help you think, well, what's relevant based on the patients I see to date on a day-to-day basis, or even if it's, you know, public health issues or other things, you can at least anchor it to patients you see in various aspects of your practice. So there is no doubt about it. Being an editor-in-chief is enriched by also being a, a clinical cardiologist. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned public health, and, you know, that is an intersection that has intrigued me for quite some time now. I think um, you know, cardiovascular disease, or, you know, as I think of it nowadays, cardiovascular health um, is synonymous with public health for me, uh, you know, at least for me and how I envision envision things. And I think that is sort of reflected in some of the work that I've sent your way as well. Um, uh, how, uh, and so I, I don't think that it was a, a realization for me when I started off, uh, you know, uh, first off as a, as a trainee within cardiovascular medicine, and then as an attending physician, but has dawned on me, particularly over the past maybe two, three years, um, when did when did it become a realization for you that, you know, public health is, is important for, for a cardiologist? Yeah, I mean, I did a master's of public health at the Harvard School of Public Health when I was a, um, a younger doctor. I, I think it would have 
I, I would have thought of it then, but I would say, you know, there is an evolution to starting to, to realize beyond the scope of just the patients you see in your clinical practice, really thinking of some big picture questions. Because in the grand scheme of things, if you're really going to make differences, I think you have to have a big, big vision. So I think it's evolved, even though, as I said, it was probably something I thought was important even very early on as a young cardiologist. But it, over the years, it's become more and more clear we need those pictures or we need those people and those researchers that are looking at big picture questions, as well as, you know, I mean, we all want to improve the clinical care of the patients we see, but we also want medicine and cardiology to evolve in the right way. And that takes some big picture insight, I think. It's not always honed into the a clinical question. So I think we need both, but you know, the public health, health economics, I know that's one of your interests. This stuff is really important. Yes. And I think it, um, you know, at least um, how I've thought of this is that, you know, we, we keep um, interacting with the health system uh, you know whether it's Canada or the U.S. or for that matter the U.K. Um, you know, uh, you know through my own uh, curriculum at the London School of Economics, have had an opportunity to learn about health systems globally. I think any f- practicing clinician, physician, cardiologist interacting with any health system in 2024 is interacting with a very complex, um, uh, you know, sort of platform where. Um, there is um, change occurring, uh, you know, at a rapid pace, and a lot of the uh, economic decisions and, and policy decisions which are made um, are impacting you directly and your patients directly. So, you know, I do think it's important for us to, not, you know, if not become experts, you know, certainly we can, we will never be experts, but at least to start uh, uh, learn about the language in which some of the policymakers. Um, you know, indulge in so that we uh, can get to be, uh, we can get to have a seat on the table, one, and two, we can get to be, you know, important uh, stakeholders or considered at least as important stakeholders, which we should be. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I really think that if the healthcare system is going to be sustainable, uh, doctors have to be involved in its development and its sustainability. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. So, uh, you know, Candice, um, when you started as the editor-in-chief for Jack Advances, um, this is a two-part question, you know. Part one of the question is, what was your vision as to the... Because, you know, I think um, over time, you know, we sort of relate to some journals accepting a particular kind of articles, right? I, I think... Or maybe that is um, that is a construct which we which we tend to form as authors who submit to different journals. Um, but uh, you know that there is a fair bit of a construct in my mind where I want to send a, a particular article to a particular journal. What was what was that vision? What what did you want to create? What was the image that you had in mind that you thought you want to disseminate for authors who would want to submit a Jack Advances? That's part one of the question. And part two of the question is, how was it challenging as an editor-in-chief of a new journal um, who, you know, which is, is searching for its uh, you know, place in PubMed, does not have an impact factor? Granted, it's with the Jack Journal's family, so uh, you know, would obviously have that reputation that uh, you know, the articles would be uh, considered with, with the same level of scrutiny and w- with the same... Uh, tenacity of peer review. Uh, w- how was it challenging to attract authors to submit to Jack Advances, given the growing number of journals among other families of reputable journals? Yeah, both of those are great questions as well. You've got a lot of good ones today. Um, so I guess, first of all, the vision for Jack Advances. I mean, it's a general cardiology journal. So the idea really was to support the general cardiology community. I, I think what my, and then we had a sec, we had two mandates. So one is we really wanted to develop this new journal. We also, I mean, it is called Jack Advances. So we also wanted to, you know, make it 
science that was moving the needle forward, advancing the field. And part of that mandate really was to try and support some of the areas of cardiology that perhaps weren't always landing in mainstream cardiology journals, but really were clearly evolving and that we could perhaps support and move forward as they grew. So, you know, for instance, we've been quite involved with ger the geriatric cardiology group or the critical care cardiology group. Obviously, I come from cardiobstetrics, and those are all new fields in cardiology that have been growing and you know, gaining momentum and also developing good science. So it was general cardiology with a focus on also helping some of these new fields um, and giving them a platform to write, to disseminate science and, you know, to, um, to help clinicians by providing, say, expert panels on some of the issues in those specific fields. So that really was the vision of Jack Advance. I have to say it's been evolving over time. And in some way, you know, a lot, some of the development of the journal itself is based on the submissions we get or by people writing in to me saying, I have this great idea. What do you think? And really, if people have ideas that are new ways of looking at things or also just important ideas that maybe could, could, could benefit by getting out there to the cardiology community, um, again, or, or more, then we try and support those things. In regards to what are the challenges, well, uh, I think the challenges are that that as a journal, when a journal gets started, I think you have to be open to adapting to things. And part of being open to adapting was to adapt to the different ideas that the different authors that were submitting papers were bringing our way. Some of them were things we hadn't even expected. A lot of them were fantastic research ideas or ideas for state of the arts. But uh, we really had to be open to listening to what the cardiology community was thinking and try and, and, and support those authors with new ideas like yourself. I mean, you have some really, I think they're kind of out of the box ideas that are important for the field of cardiology that, you know, maybe 10 years ago wouldn't, wouldn't be topics that we would think about trying to push forward. And, you know, it's really to support people with new ideas. But as I said, it's general cardiology journals. So we're open to lots of different things. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, well, you know, thank you for, for those answers. Those were terrific answers. You know, I think I was going to say that speaking from my own um, experience with working with Jack Advances with yourself um, as an author who's um, sort of gets excited <laughs> and very easily and is sort of, um, you know, may, may at times be considered overly ambitious. Um, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed working with, um, with, with your team and with you in particular, because um, you've been very open-minded about, um, you know, receiving ideas from me, which, uh, you know, some of the traditional, uh, you know, high impact journals within cardiovascular medicine would, I wouldn't say raise an eyebrow, but would be like, oh, this is a little too outlandish for us, you know, or this is a little too, uh, little too out there for us. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm grateful that you've, you've been open-minded and, uh, you know, have had the, uh, had the appetite to, to read those submissions, to, to take a look at them, to, to give them fair chance, you know, in peer review and, and otherwise. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are others, um, you know, like myself who, want to sort of push the envelope and sort of think outside the box. So that's very heartening for me to hear. By the way, um, I love your enthusiasm, but I also love your creativity. And um, it's been a real treat to get to work with you on some of your publications. Thank you. Thank you for that. That, that means a lot to me, as I'm sure will meet, mean a lot to, you know, some of the investigators and co-authors that I work with uh, as well. Um, so, you know, Candice, uh, moving forward, um, where do you see academic publishing heading? I mean, you know, I, there is a lot of conversation around AI. Um, I'm sure that is um, that has imposed challenges for you as you know, as an editor in chief, and for someone who's leading a, a journal of the caliber of Jack Advances. Um, I mean, with tools like chat GPT and AI, how do you, I'm sure there are mechanisms in place, or I, I don't know if there are, or if there should be, I, I, I just don't know. I know that 
journals like, for example, Annals of Internal Medicine want authors to disclose if they used any form any form of open AI to enhance readability of their articles. Um, I mean, how are you handling all these issues? I mean, these are very contemporary 2024 issues for authors and publishers. How are you handling all these issues? That is a really important um, concept that I don't think we fully know how we're going to handle it as time goes on. I can tell you the the Jack family of journals has released a similar type statement saying, please disclose if you use large language models like like GPT, like chat GPT um, or other ones. Um, but things are clearly going to evolve in the next five or 10 years, and they're going to change pretty fast. And I think one of the ideas behind this statement that came out from Jack is it's it's a pretty vague statement. It's not so precise. It just says, let us know if you're doing it and make sure you disclose it. But I think as time goes on, we'll understand better what we're doing dealing with and probably have more precise um, guidelines for authors. But Right now, I think they're somewhat vague because we don't exactly know how this is going to evolve. I mean, there's potentially some good sides to it. You know, I mean, it it may help with uh, authors, uh, investigators where English isn't their first language. There may be ways to use it to edit things better. There may be even ways in which things can help with peer, with these these types of technologies can help with peer review or the whole publishing process in general. But we don't really know where we're at right now because it's so new. And I think we just have to keep our eyes open. And I think we have to keep revisiting as we figure out how we're going to tackle it because um, it's clearly coming and and things are going to change. I know that's not a specific answer, but that's kind of where we're at, I think. Yeah, no, I think also, um, you know, I, I think you you use the right word to to describe it. I think wake is the right word because like even I don't know where um, in, the, in the writing space or in the publishing space, these tools and technologies are going to be, um, you know, additive rather than destructive because you know the way i see it now is that maybe they're destructive to the um to the art of writing a paper yeah, uh, you know if if chat gpt can write a paper for you uh, it sort of is um not that it's misleading it's just um uh, it just leaves a bad taste uh, for, in someone's uh, particularly for and I'm, I'm speaking on my behalf here it leaves a bad taste um in someone like me, because you know, I know that I put a lot of effort into writing whatever I want to write, um, and that, and that, um, maybe it does not may, maybe does not affect much of scientific writing uh, as much as it does abstract writing. But I do know that, which I, I and I do both of both of abstract as well as scientific writing, and I, I do think that there is a component of writing which is inherent to authors' own ideas and and mind and and that should come forth in that piece of work and should not be uh, you know artificially constructed by something like a chat gpt but you know but again that's me just speaking on my behalf so i think you just you use the right word by calling it vague i i absolutely agree with you i mean to me it's so interesting when i read papers because Every paper has the personality of the authors that have submitted it. And even though scientific writing is, you know, clearly more dry than than obviously creative writing, it still has a personality. And so I hope that isn't lost. And I hope people don't use it completely to write papers, because I think that's one of the unique things about even scientific papers. But I do think maybe it's valuable in editing. I hope people still write their own papers because they're so much to be gained from putting your ideas down in paper. And I think you actually can think about your data and your results and the meaning of your paper much better if you do that aspect of things. But but maybe things like editing will be helpful. Yes, I, I think um, you're, you're right in that, uh, you know, these tools uh, can help you with, with editing, which which is is going to augment, you know, what the authors have um, have put together uh, you know, in their first pass draft, uh, and I, I do think that journals, you know, at least for now, like you said, 
are, are have come out with a plea to disclose upfront if any of these tools have been have been used. You know, th- there is one aspect of AI that I think uh, um, is going to be need to address first, and that is data um, or image fabrication. And uh, you've probably heard of this already, where images are being fabricated with AI tools. That's going to be a problem that I think even before this use of of large language models, we're going to have to figure out also, we're going to have to figure out what to do about data fabrication as it relates to images. Yes, you know, no, thank you for bringing that to light. I was not aware of that. Um, but, you know, thank you for bringing that to the fore. Um, what I wanted to discuss moving forward was a few of the aspects of peer review, uh, which, uh, you know, I know is not perfect science. Um, how do you as an editor-in-chief, balance um, dichotomizing views or polarizing views on one paper. If you send it out to two reviewers, uh, do you try and then get a third reviewer on board? Um, That's, again, sorry about these two-part questions, but I I think they sort of go hand in hand. So that's the first part. And and the the second part would be, how do you then balance... um, an unfavorable peer review with disgruntled authors. How, how do you how do you how do you sort of balance the act? Is what I wanted to ask you as an editor in chief. So I'll start with the easier one. If we get two really discrepant reviews, we try and find somebody who can review it and act as a third author. Sometimes it's one of our editorial board who can step in, give it a really fair shake, and try and 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 be the third person. But when there's two that are very different, you know, it actually in some ways makes you really pay attention and then try and go and look at it in a lot more detail. So we try and do that to balance things out. Um, Many times reviews are somewhat similar. They're never perfectly similar people. You know, people all see things differently through their own perspective, but um, uh, but really, really discrepant reviews, we try and get get somebody else to take a look at it. In terms of what to do about um, authors that are unhappy with the reviews, well, I try to give the authors the benefit of the doubt. If they think it wasn't fairly reviewed, then I try and find somebody else who will give it another review and give it another round. If 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 what if they write back to me and I think it's a reasonable request, and sometimes it is a reasonable request, we're, we're certainly not perfect, and so so I try and look at their look from their view vantage point, and if, if I think it's reasonable, then we give it another go. Yeah, it's um, you know it could be a tough act, and I certainly don't envy you. You know, they're dealing with disgruntled authors, but I would say more people. People are generally fair. And um, I think when authors have come back and said, I don't think this review is fair, I have to tell you a lot of times, I think they're not unreasonable when they ask us to reconsider things. So, um, yeah, I, I'm sure, you know, not every, I'm not saying everybody's really happy about things, but uh, I do find if you try and tackle things, you know, in a fair way, people tend to respond generally. Yeah. And then, you know, as, as an extension to this question, how is, is there a mechanism for you to select peer reviews? I know there is, um, there is a, a pool of peer reviewers who are available uh, for reviewing, uh, you know, a particular topic. And, you know, I'm sure as the journal grows older, there is an ever enriching repository of such reviewers. But is there uh, a particular method that you that you employ for selecting peer reviewers for a particular topic? Yeah, I mean, if it's a topic I know well, um, I will try and find people that I know are experts in that domain. If I, if it's a topic I don't know, I will do a lit review and try and find experts in the field that are related to that specific topic. Or, you know, look at the references and find out, you know, papers they've referenced that are related to their their um, their study. So um, I will go looking to try and find people that can review it, that have published in the field, or that are experts in that domain, so that the authors can have a review by somebody that can actually look at the science. Mm-hmm. And then uh, 
putting together an editorial board, how, how do you go about doing that? Um, that was that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. I think for you as an editor in chief for Advances, so you can maybe speak on the behalf of Advances. But I think, in a broader sense, how does Jack Journals, the family of Jack Journals, goes about putting together editorial boards? Was another question I wanted to ask. Um, yeah, they they do leave it uh, to the editor in chief, but you know there's there's some guidelines that I think any reasonable editor in chief follows that I think probably. I probably speak for most of the editor in chief at Jack. You really want a balanced uh, editorial board. So not only do you want to expertise in different fields, but you want people from different parts of the uh, United States or different parts of the world. You want different genders. You want you want really people that um, represent the entire cardiology community and not just. For instance, one institution or something like that, which was, by the way, how it often was done back in the day. You know, you'd see a whole bunch of the editorial board all from one institution. So I think the real key is to find a balance with diversity. And and I think most people nowadays put a real effort into thinking about that for their editorial board. Yeah, absolutely. What is the favorite part of um, leading? the editorial board for Jack Advances for you, and what is the least favorite part? Okay, the least fa- I'll start with least favorite. The least favorite is juggling time. You know, it, it takes a lot of time to do this job, uh, but the most favorite is you're on a new learning curve. It's fun. It's something different. I think it ultimately will have an impact. I also get to meet new people like yourself, new authors, new investigators. I get to read these great cardiology studies or state of the arts or mm-hmm. viewpoints that are really clever. And so it's actually really fun because you get to keep learning. So I, if anybody has the opportunity, again, I know you've done this before, but I think maybe people are hesitant because it takes a lot of time, but it's a great experience. Uh, certainly, at least with Jack, I'm, I'm going to say with with the managing editors and the scientific publication committee at ACC. It's been a great experience. Yes. And, you know, for someone who's interested uh, in a role like yourself, how, and in terms of, uh, you said juggling time is is a challenge and is, is a least favorite part, which I think, you know, for all of us who juggle um, different tasks and activities outside our, our clinical roles, you know, do find that a, a struggle. Uh, how um, how much time do you think one would need to allocate for a position like yourself, for someone who's listening and is interested in pursuing a similar role in their career? Yeah, so it's it's completely been evolving at Jack Advances because the number of submissions just keeps ramping up. And so it will really depend on how big the journal is. I mean, there's probably some journals where, you know, if they're not if they're not publishing high volumes, Maybe if you had half a day or a day a week, um, Jack Advances certainly takes more time from that. And I think somebody like Valentin Fuster or Harlan Krumholtz who will be coming on board to run Main Jack, um, a large portion of another week would be taken doing editorial work. Now, that being said, um, you know, some of that time is your weekend. Some of that time is at night because... As I said, in the end, I think everybody still maintains a role as a clinical cardiologist. So you squeeze it in when you can. But with something like Jack Advances, where we're at right now, minimum a few days a week. But again, you know, different. Every journal is going to have a different need, and some of them, if you if you have less submissions, you won't have to spend as much time doing it. Yeah, you know, final few minutes of the of the podcast here, uh, Candice, uh, where do you see, um, and I think I sort of alluded to this a little earlier too in our conversation, where do you see in the broader realm, not only pertaining to Jack Advances, but now in the broader realm of academic publishing, where do you see this go in like 10 years or maybe five years? Yeah, well, it's very interesting because, you know, in reality, I mean, it was centuries ago when they started creating medical journals. And they've kind of been the same for hundreds of years, which is a paper journal, some studies in it. You distribute a subscription and people read it. But clearly right now, everything is changing. And that's not just large language models or open access, but everything is changing. One is 
The paper models are gone. You know, you have these digital journals that offers the hope of having more interactive journals. So the journal doesn't have to just be read a paper, but you can have interactive models. If you look at the Jack website, Valentin Fuster, when he ran the um, Global Cardiovascular um, series also created these interactive websites where you can go and find out about, you know, cardiovascular stats in countries all around the world. Some of the central illustrations in the Jack journals are now interactive. The journal, the papers also have podcasts with them. So we've just hit this inflection point where, you know, the old paper subscription journal is changing. And we now have all these different ways that it might change. We are at the very start of what a journal is going to be because it is it is not going to be what we know. And I mean, there's another aspect that's really interesting, which is how people even acquire information as a cardiologist anymore. Again, back in the day, everybody got their Jack journal and they read it. But that's not really how people are picking up information. Part of it, because there's so much information to sift through now. You know, there is this vision that maybe we'll have these kind of bespoke um, uh, journals that will be not really one specific journal, but tailored to your interests where you log in and you get information from a bunch of different sources that are all related to the journal or to your, the aspects of cardiology that are relevant for you. So you have these kind of tailored a tailored input instead of a journal just being very, you know, you look at the table of contents and, and then you look, decide which ones you want to read. Instead, it'll be a digital format that'll feed you information. In some ways, you know, a little bit like if you're on Instagram and you, you know, if you're looking on Instagram, it clearly is giving you tailored Instagram hits or hits that are relevant to things you're interested in. I think the journal of the future will be something like that, but exactly what it will look like remains to be determined. So I think that's happening. I mean, the other aspect of the, the journal of the future, and you you mentioned this earlier, but I think it's important, this idea of open access. Open access just means it allows people everywhere to look at science. It is a little tricky because instead of paying for a subscription, you're having the investigator pay, so you're paying to publish. Um, and probably the exact price point is still a work to be determined because sometimes the price point is high. But open access really does make science available for all, which is theoretically a great idea. Yes, and I, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of the – here's how I look at this, right? And um I don't know what's the right answer or the wrong answer, but uh, I do know that disproportionately, uh, the burden of and the scourge of cardiovascular disease in particular is in Southeast Asia or South Asia. And um, I think having um, our colleagues in, in you know, Asian and African continents or low and middle income countries where the burden of disease is actually higher, you know, pave to, pave to access you know, um, cutting edge science um, is is a bit of a double whammy. Is like yes, you know, one on one end you're dealing with a higher burden, and then two, you sort of need to pay uh, to get to cutting edge science, and you know, you are in a low middle income, you know, economic, um, um, you know, ecosystem, and and that just becomes that just becomes hard. It, it just it, it just is becomes hard. So I think for for our colleagues in in Africa and Asia and other low and middle income countries and in other continents, I think it's a it's a great tool to make science open access, uh, and I'm I'm all for it. I think um, there's the other end to it, right? To where now you're you're having some of the predatory journals, you know, take advantage of of open access and uh, you know coming up with X, Y, and Z journals, which no one has any idea about. That is the downside of open access. I mean, the problem is. The, the the massive growth of predatory journals. And even in some ways, the difficulty of sorting out is if it is a predatory journal. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think like with everything else, right? Like every tool will have its good and its bad. And it's um, it's up to us to determine, you know, which paths to choose and, you know, what's the, what, what is the right balance to strike? Um, 
You know, this has been a, a fascinating conversation, Candice. Uh, my very final question, I think, in part is, um, you know, I'm being selfish here, is to ask you when we're seeing Jack Advances Index on PubMed and when we're going to have an impact factor. And then any closing remarks for, for Parallax and, and for our listenership? Yeah, you know, you have to apply for um, PubMed and an impact factor. Uh, I assume the PubMed PubMed application will go through very soon, fingers crossed. Uh, but once we get that, I really just follow the advice of Elsevier, the publishers, as to when we can apply for impact factor. But believe me, the minute we can do it, we will do it because that will benefit all the authors, A, that have published so far and all the authors in the future. I think these are just really important metrics. Certainly getting into PubMed for me is a, is a major metric that we need, to, a major hurdle we need to get over. But I do feel it's coming soon. And what was your last question? My last question was not a question, actually. It was just about any closing remarks for Parallax or uh, for, our, for our listeners. Well, I love Parallax, and um, I've been listening it, uh, to it for a while. And I really do want to congratulate you on two fronts. One is that you clearly started this Home for Cardiology podcast well before the trend really hit. So first of all, hats off to you for being quite innovative. But second of all, I really like it because you include topics I wouldn't always be exposed to, and um, and it's a really a really great place to listen to new ideas. Even for me as a journal editor, it's great because I get when I listen to some of these, I'm like some of these topics you've included. I'm like, oh, that's coming in the pipes. We should be on the lookout for those types of papers and you know people that are thinking of those types of ideas. Clearly, it's. It's an important aspect of cardiology that's coming. So for Parallax, I would just say keep it up. It's a great place for us. There's not that many podcasts like this for cardiologists that are, A, not only cardiology-based, but kind of innovative and creative and bring you to different areas of cardiology that are just fun to hear about. So thank you for doing that. Oh, no, thank you. That that means a lot to us. Uh, I'm sure, um, you know, myself included and the team at Parallax who works diligently to produce these episodes, um, you know, every other Monday, it means a lot to to get that feedback from you, who's, um, you know, the editor-in-chief of a, a major cardiovascular journal. Uh, Candice, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, to have you on board. Um, you know, for those of you who have tuned in to listen, you know, do drop in your feedback. We take it very seriously. Uh, you can reach out to us in any of the social media platforms or just email us. The email is uh, at, our, at our show notes um, if you're listening, um, uh, you know, through any of the uh, major podcast platforms. Once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast produced by Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. We aim to bring you a new angle of all things cardiology every second week. Review us on your favourite podcast app or send your comments or questions to podcast at ratcliffe-group.com. To view the series, head to radcliffecardiology.com forward slash podcasts forward slash parallax. Thanks for listening.